Welcome everyone to the history and future of child wealth of Indian Child Welfare Act implications for tribal sovereignty and native family preservation. My name is Kara Fink and I am the director of the interdisciplinary child advocacy clinic here at the University of Pennsylvania Cary Law School. Um, and I am thrilled to be joining all of you today for this important and engaging discussion. I want to thank the Penn Cary Law School for their support in helping us bring together our distinguished group of panelists this morning. And I also want to thank the Field Center for Children's um, Policy Practice and Research for supporting this work and bringing us together. I am thrilled to introduce our panelists, but want to start with some housekeeping items. Um, as you know, we will be offering CLE and CEU credits, um, and we will be recording today's virtual symposium. If you would like to submit a question, please use the question and answer feature that is found on the ribbon at the bottom of the window of your Zoom window. Please keep your questions topical and appropriate. Um, anyone posting inappropriate language or content will be removed from the symposium webinar. As we are offering CLE and CEU credits, if you are seeking CLE credit for today's event, please note that codes will be presented twice per hour. Therefore, for today's symposium, we will have three CLE codes. We would encourage you to write those codes down or enter them on your digital evaluation form once the event is over. The evaluation form is mandatory to receive CLE credits. Please find the link to the evaluation form in the chat. The first CLE passcode is court. Again, the first CLE passcode, passcode is court. I am thrilled to introduce the three panelists that have joined us today to discuss this critical issue. Um, first of all, Kimberly Clough is the legal director at the California Tribal Families Coalition. Her legal career has focused on Indian law, including litigation on tribal child welfare, governance, and infrastructure. Her legislative efforts have included the Tribal Customary Adoption Act and securing resources for tribes. Kimberly started her legal career at the California Indian Legal Services offices and then worked as a partner at Foreman & Associates. After serving as legal counsel for the Morongo Band of Mission Indians for nearly 15 years, Kimberly attended the Goldman School of Public Policy at Berkeley, graduating in July of this year. She brings a wealth of experience in this field and a perspective that is critical to this discussion. Nikki Farrago is Deputy Commissioner at the Minnesota Department of Human Services, where she oversees the Office of Employee Culture, the Office of Equity, Inclusion, Communications, Legislative Affairs, and External Relations, which includes the Office of Indian Policy. She comes to the position from her role as Assistant Commissioner of Children and Family Services and previously served as Deputy Solicitor General for the Mill Locks Band of Ojibwe, where she practiced in state and tribal courts with a specific focus on Indian child welfare cases. As a graduate of the University of Georgia, she earned her JD from the University of Minnesota Law School and holds a certificate in human services leadership from the Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. She has served as a member of the Minnesota Supreme Court's Committee for Equality and Justice and currently sits on the Board of Directors of the Indian Child Welfare Act Law Center in Minneapolis. She is also a lineal descendant of the Seneca Nation. And finally, we are thrilled to have Sheldon Spotted Elk, who is the Senior Director for Judicial and National Engagement at Casey Family Programs. He is an agent of change to improve legal outcomes for children and families involved in the child welfare system, who works regularly as a strategic partner with both tribal and state court systems. He serves as a judge for a tribal court of appeals, has taught adjunct courses, and provided lectures at law schools throughout the country, and has authored numerous articles on tribal law and Indian Child Welfare Act. We are thrilled to have our group today to discuss the history and the future of the Indian Child Welfare Act, which we know had, was one of the most seminal civil rights cases in the country and is currently under review for, for this term in the Supreme Court. So I want to, first of all, turn this over to Kimberly, who will start us with a discussion and some grounding in the Indian Child Welfare Act, commonly referred to as ICWA, and some of the best practices that she has worked with during her long and illustrious career. Thank you so much, Kara. Really appreciate that introduction. Very humbling to be on with my co-presenters. 
So I am going to get us started. And I just wanted to reflect that um, the, the point of this time this morning, our mandate to um, deliver to all of you who are um, listening and watching is to walk through the role of ICWA and innovative practices that advance and improve tribal child welfare and, and the interests of tribes. And so I'm going to start with um, walking through some of how the organization that I'm currently with, California Tribal Families Coalition, has done that um, with some innovations, both in the type of advocacy and how the advocacy happens. So if my, if my esteemed colleague at Penn Carey could advance the slides, that would be lovely. So that is the purpose of our presentation this morning. And, um, and we will walk through those innovative practices uh, as quickly as we can and hoping to leave time for questions. Next slide, please. So the existence of the California Tribal Families Coalition in and of itself is an innovative practice. And I wanna focus on how CTFC came into existence. You see there the California Equal Compliance Task Force Report California Tribal Families Coalition was born of a task force report that was put together by tribal leaders, um, having initially met with then Attorney General of California, Kamala Harris, tribal leaders realized that um, to bring concerns around equal compliance to the forefront, they needed to bring data and information. And so CTFC was formed out of the equal compliance task force report Next slide, please. So just a little bit of level setting on kind of why uh, the Indian Child Welfare Act exists um, to be sure that everybody kind of has that basic grounding. So the Indian Child Welfare Act is a federal statute passed by Congress in 1978. Its key component is that recognition of tribal rights in the world of child welfare when Indian children are in the system. And what ICWA does is through minimum federal standards, so through that statute, it protects the interests of Indian children and tribes. And this is important that the interests of Indian children are advanced by protection of the rights of tribes to be involved in those Indian children's lives. The Congress recognized in passing ICWA that Indian children are really such a vital resource to the continued existence of tribes. And so it is that interlinking of the existence, sanctity and safety of native children that tribes continue to exist in the United States. I welcome anybody who is interested to go back and see some of the history, read some of the history around the passage of ICWA, which um, is both heartbreaking and also phenomenal in that the rates of removal of native children from their tribal communities and from their families the rates of family separation before the passage of ICWA were heartbreaking, were um, untenable. Some states as high, for example, in California, three of five children affected by the system. There are some states where those numbers are even worse. Next slide, please. So innovative practices at CTFC. The first one that I wanna talk about is what I call the show me strategy. And this really comes from what I mentioned earlier, which is the California Tribal Families Coalition coming out of that report, the California Equal Compliance Task Force report. And what you see there on the next slide is the cover of that Equal Compliance Task Force report. And then next to it, another report produced by California Tribal Families Coalition. And what is so key is that the strategy of CTFC has been, and I think a really key strategy in this work, is that we have gone out and we have listened to Indian country through, for example, surveys, listening sessions, and different mechanisms to bring the voice of Indian country into the conversation and to utilize data that's, call, that's called 
directly from Indian country. We know that data is such an important driver of this work. And so we know that we've got to have the voices of Indian country involved in bringing that data and bringing those stories forward. And so that's what we do with bringing those reports out. And that has been a continuing strategy of California Tribal Families Coalition. And we see that increasing in Indian country, the use of narrative in report form. And so we take the voice of Indian country, we put it into written form and we make sure that it's backed up by data. And that has been a strategy of advocacy at California Tribal Families Coalition. We see other organizations doing that and it really has been effective. Um, I welcome folks. We will be loading our annual report for CTFC up onto our website soon. And when I see the annual report, I am struck by the fact that the mode of advocacy that we have advanced using um, data and reports, and we've published probably five, um, is been extremely successful in moving advocacy forward. So the next, um, I, I want to just digress for just a moment on the next slide. Um, I want to talk about a very specific um, innovative best practice that we have done in California. And this is tribal customary adoption. So tribal customary adoption was a bill done um, several years ago here in California. And what, how it came about is that tribes said, hey, we are very, um, and, and I'm going to um, use, I'm going to kind of generalize here, right? Every tribe has different systems and different backgrounds and, and uh, belief systems and worldviews. I, I don't want to generalize too much, but the in California, tribal leaders said, we understand the need for permanence. And we hear that all the time. And of course, many tribal leaders said to me, like permanence comes through connection with tribe because foster parents and even adoptive parents can come and go, but the tribe will always be here. How do we achieve permanence, but at the same time, not have extraordinarily offensive practices of child welfare visited upon our families? And what those tribal leaders said was, we believe in the making of relatives. We believe in permanency and stability for children, but we find the termination of, of um, parental rights to be incredibly offensive when it comes to our tribal beliefs and our, our worldview. And so if you can see there on that slide, um, a specific innovative best practice, what tribal customary adoption is, it's a state court adoption without termination of parental rights, that is only selected by the tribe and tribal decision-making is at the core of the process of tribal customary adoption. So what's key is that we found a strategy to be responsive to tribal needs within the realm of tenable tribal child welfare. We put voice and data behind that strategy and we have implemented the California Tribal Customary Adoption Bill. We're going on a decade now. We've had a couple of appeals of tribal customary adoptions, um, but the statute has stood the test of time. And it's been a real honor to work with other states that have moved forward with developing a similar permanency option for native children. Next slide, please. Okay. So that is tribal customary adoption. Next slide, please. Okay, so I talked about the show me innovative strategy and that is the use of taking the voice of Indian country, creating reports that we then use to advance the advocacy that we do, for example, ad, uh, advancing legislation, advancing policy. Um, now, the second innovative practice that we have been working on now at CTFC is tribal legal representation. And um, I'm gonna just basically explain it and then um, go into a little bit more. Tribal legal representation is a project, it's a, it's a concept, which is really um, tribes are the only party that walk into a state dependency action in California. And this is the case nationwide, although there's variations on legal representation in dependency. But the truth is, or the reality is, that tribes are the only party across the country that walks into a dependency court, 
a 300 core to child welfare case with no legal representation supported through public funds. In many, many states in the United States, children and parents have an absolute right to legal counsel. There's no state in the United States where tribes, although granted the right to legal counsel, um, to, to participation in cases, has the right to legal counsel that is publicly funded. This is particularly difficult for low resource tribes, tribes that don't have the ability to retain counsel on their own with their own resources. So we have tremendous variation across the country with regard to the ability of tribes to engage in cases, participate in cases, bring forward evidence, um, and, and really be at the table to protect the best interests of children and families. Next slide, please. So going back to that first strategy of hearing the story and creating the data, to achieve equity in courtrooms, to protect the judicial processes of dependency courtrooms, to improve outcomes for Native families, to protect tribal sovereignty, we must provide dependency or child welfare legal representation for tribes. This is an absolute. California Tribal Families Coalition has been focused on this because this was one of the recommendations that emanated directly from the ICWA Compliance Task Force. So if you see, look there on the slide, you'll see, and I apologize, it's, it's got a lot of text there, but that is an example of the type of data that we brought forward to support the effort of advancing the idea that tribes need legal representation. And here's the data in a, in a summary there. California has more ICWA appeals, meaning cases that head into an appeal than the rest of the country combined times two. Over 500 uh, appeals in 2021 and 2022 is on, uh, on track to look very much the same. So going out and having that data going out and gathering um, those numbers has been pivotal in telling the story of why we need legal representation. Because when we have that inundation of appeals, what does it do, right? It delays permanency for children. It is a huge um, resource strain on the judicial system. And it also really, unfortunately, undermines folks support for the Indian Child Welfare Act on occasion because they think, oh gosh, these cases, they are so difficult, they are so complicated. And so by bringing that data forward, we are able to tell the story of why legal representation for tribes is so necessary. So what did we do with that data and lots of other data that supports the idea that tribes need legal representation that is publicly supported so to create that parity with other partners? Next slide, please. So California Tribal Families Coalition launched what we call LC4T. Now, one more slide back, please. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Um, LC4T, Legal Council for Tribes. This is an initiative that we launched. Um, and the goal of this initiative is to secure both public funding, um, foundation funding, tribal funding, to create a, the ability of for every tribe to have access to highly skilled, highly trained legal counsel so that no tribe finds themselves walking into the courtroom alone trying to defend the unique and complex rights of their tribal citizens. I will note one other strategy that we employ at CTFC is often having really great pictures of beautiful native children, <laughs> um, which you can see there. So that legal counsel for tribes um, project is about eight months in. We are in courtrooms around California, and we are already seeing tremendous results. One of the things that we um, have seen, which we anticipated, but I don't know that we anticipated to the level that we've seen, and I think this is a very important strategy, and I know my um, amazing colleague Sheldon will also speak to this, but what we've seen is, we, uh, is the bench um, and also retained or um, uh, other counsel needing to um, maybe up their game a little bit and being very open to a lot of training and support because our LC4T attorneys are showing up 
ready to defend the rights of tribes in a, in a very um, grounded way with tremendous knowledge and tremendous experience. And so what we're seeing is an overall increase in the, the practice in courts. And you know, some of these are very rural courts. Some of them have not had a large number of ICWA cases. Um, some of them have bench officers or other stakeholders in the system that turn over frequently. And so we see as an additional role and strategy, increasing both the capacity and the competence of everybody in that courtroom. That helps the tribes, it helps the families, it helps the children. And it um, has courts feeling very good about their managing of these really important cases. Next slide, please. So the last of our three um, strategies I wanted to talk about is what we call the three basket box them in. And what we have done at CTFC is we operate in three baskets. We start with a policy and legislative basket for our advocacy. And that is where we are getting bills passed in the state legislature. We are working with our state stakeholders on developing great policy. We're looking at the big picture, which is super important, all aspects. When we change the law or when we change the policy, when we increase capacity within tribes, we then train to that. We develop curriculum and we go out and we're a resource for training. And that's basket number two. We have a director of training and curriculum. And then our third basket, where the box of in kind of comes in, is we have the legal basket. And that's what I look up, uh, well, that's what I head. And, um, and that is the legal basket. And so we kind of joke that we, we help write the law and policy, we train the law and policy, and if folks don't get it right, I sue them when they don't get the law and policy correct. And that's our three basket box them in. Um, and we think that that's a really effective um, methodology of advancing advocacy within the child welfare sphere. Now, I do want to back up for just a moment and talk just for a moment on the Indian Child Welfare Act um, and kind of where we are. As um, Kara mentioned, we're at a very pivotal time in ICWA because on November 9th, the Supreme Court of the United States will hear oral argument on a case that is a facial constitutional attack on this statute. This is um, a precarious and scary time for many of us who are, have our um, focus on Indian country and child welfare. The Brackeen v. Halland case um, involves two attacks on the Indian Child Welfare Act an equal protection challenge and an anti-commandeering challenge. And um, both of these are, um, you know, nothing makes it to the Supreme Court without being hotly contested and complex. Um, and certainly uh, we can loop back to any questions on Brackeen after my colleagues go. But it's just important to note that conversations around the efficacy of the Indian Child Welfare Act, the need for it, and something that I know will be mentioned, the fact that it is best practice, not just for Native children, but now we've learned since 1978, best practice um, in many ways, we've learned and increased um, our capacity and our, our good work in Indian child welfare policy generally, based on the leadership that ICWA provided on many aspects, for example, kin care um, with the Indian Child Welfare Act. We use the terminology, the gold standard, that ICWA is the gold standard. And, um, and with that, I wanna pass it over to my esteemed colleagues. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kimberly, for that um, really important and really innovative description and explanation of the work that you have been doing out in California. Um, and also to help us start to think about some of the challenges that we are facing in what is the best practice in child welfare and the gold standard. I now want to turn it over to Sheldon Spotted Elk, who will speak about his experience working with ICWA in a variety of capacities, both in technical assistance, strategic planning, um, and as a judge as well, and hear from him about his work. Sheldon? Thank you. Appreciate it, Kara. And thank you to Penn Law. This is really wonderful. And Kimberly, you always knock it out of the park. So thank you so much. And excited to hear from Nikki as well. Um, exciting to be with you. 127 of us on this conversation. And so it's really exciting to talk about some of these things. I, I, I am going to take a little bit of a step back in my presentation just to talk a little bit about the history. I failed to in my uh, bio that I shared, I felt to add that I'm a member of the Northern Cheyenne tribe. 
Um, I'm a father, I have two sons, um, 17 and 13 years old. Um, and so this is real life for me. Um, this is some real important things for Indian country, for my family. Um, I, I am a descendant, a close descendant of, of boarding schools. There was an Indian boarding school project that was aimed to assimilate and kill the Indian and save the man that impacted my family. I, I see that show itself uh, in my family, even in 2022. Um, and so these are all important and serious things that really impact communities. And hopefully if I do this right, I could talk to you and convey that and why that's important. And then I also wanna to talk to you a little bit about ICWA courts. Um, and so what, what's happening, what is an ICWA court? You know, um, So I wanna answer that question um, and share a little bit about the innovations with ICWA court. And maybe some of you guys are gonna become uh, child dependency lawyer or represent parents or the agency or children. Um, at one point I did represent children in this process. Um, I want you to think about while well, I'm talking and maybe you could even add it in the, the question or I don't even know if we could communicate that way, but maybe just for yourself, what does it mean to be a gold standard lawyer? What does it mean to be a solution oriented social worker? You know, So what does that mean uh, for you? Um, and what do you, maybe you haven't practiced yet. What would that look like for you? Um, so that's something to put in the back of your mind while I'm talking to you um, and share. I'm gonna share a screen. I have a little presentation, a couple of slides that I wanna share with you that I think are better shared um, and visual rather than... Uh, <laughs> so the first thing I wanna I want to, I want to share a couple of pictures, actually. These, this is some art, some great art with you. I think art oftentimes is a way that we could see uh, into different cultures uh, if we don't have necessarily exposure to that. I actually grew up in Southern Utah. So I grew up out near the Navajo reservation. I'm, even though I'm Northern Cheyenne and from Montana, I grew up down in the Four Corners area where Utah, Arizona, New Mexico and Colorado intersect. There's a pictograph down there. It's called the Circle of Friends. Um, it's by the Pueblo people. And I, I look at this, it's the one with the, uh, it's, it's it's the one with the circle of friends, frankly. <laughs> and so you can see it right there. Um, and, I, and I look at that and I just see, wow, what a powerful community. You see children in there. Uh, you, you see parents in there. You see aunties, uncles. You see ceremonial leaders in there. Um, and, and people are holding hands. And so uh, I just recently heard a term recently called kin-centric. So not concentric, but kin-centric. So relative, like kin and getting us connected. I think that's indigenizing family uh, integrity, us being, rec being able to recognize extended relations. Sometimes those relations ain't necessarily by blood. Um, so us being cognizant of that and being able to understand and look at other people's families and, and have humility, cultural humility, if you will, uh, when we see the other ways that people define their family um, and the ways that they build resiliency in, in their community and their children, um, that's really key and, and critical in, in being able to see that um, as a gold standard lawyer or social worker. Um, the other piece of art is from a Southern Cheyenne, so not Northern Cheyenne, but Southern Cheyenne named R Richard West. Um, we're a Sundance tribe. This is our ceremony. Uh, we do it every year after summer solstice. Uh, it's to renew our relationship with the earth and re renew our relationship with one another. The cool thing about it, you can't really see it. And so it's a four day ceremony that, that you go without food and water, that the pledgers, that's what they call these guys in here, guys and girls that are in there. Um, doing that, their sacrifice, um, but at the very base of their center pole there, so this is a lodge that's constructed, at the very base of that center pole, there's, there's little animals there. So before the ceremony even starts, it's children that start off the ceremony. So as a little child, you get some clay and you can make an animal, you can make whatever you want, a horse, a buffalo, <laughs> a bird, and you get to bring it in there and you usher in our renewal to the earth. There is a Cheyenne term called Mahio Kachkun, it means creator's child. Um, and it's really cool. Even if you, you and I went walking down Cheyenne Avenue in Lamedur, Montana right now, we would see little kids walking around with five braids. That's the metaphor of Mahion Gutch Gun, creator's child. And it, you'll see four braids in all four directions. Uh, the four directions we, we believe are sacred um, and that we're at the center of that. Um, but children will have a fifth braid at the very top of their hair. Um, it's their umbilical cord to the divine. And so it's to remind all of us that see these five braids, that children are sacred uh, and they're connected. Uh, just them being in our presence is a gift to us. And they're at the very center of our ceremonial and social life. And so um, you see that in a lot of different ways in, in my tribe, uh, in a lot of other tribes as well. So um, 
I want to share one more quick story and then I'll get to ICFA courts. Um, so this is a picture of me. I got to go to have, have a beer and lunch with Bert Hirsch, uh, who this guy is. He's one of the three lawyers, the other two being Frank Ducheneau and Alan Parker that put pen to paper and wrote ICWA 44 years ago. Um, and so I went to New York City one time and it's across the street but from NYU Law School with Jack Trope, the guy in the middle right there, and we're chatting it up. And he told us so many stories that lunch turned into dinner. And we were there all night. But he told me two things that really I took with me and I, and I want to share with you. As one, he said, ICWA is the only reparative law on the books. Reparative law. And you can read it in the congressional findings. You can read what it says, is that when there was 25 to 35% of all American Indian children removed and placed out of home, and 90% of those children were placed with non-natives, this is what they were trying to address. They were trying to repair that. Uh, and so there's more work that needs to be done with truth and reconciliation. Uh, but what was revolutionary about the Indian Child Welfare Act is that it was trying to address, readdress um, some wrong. Um, and so I think that's powerful. And then the other thing that he said, uh, and for me, this really just kind of guides a lot of my work that I get to do, um, that after all, ICWA is just cuss word, <laughs> words on a paper. It takes people, you and I, working together for it to reach its highest aspirations, uh, for us to capture the spirit of the law, if you will. Um, and so I, I carry that in all the work that I do. I thought it was some great wisdom. Um, of course, it's already been said that ICWA is called the gold standard of child welfare. Why that is, and I'll quickly run through that. Of course, there's a higher standard uh, to prevent removal, active efforts as opposed to reasonable efforts, um, active efforts throughout the case to reunify children with their families. Um, there's a placement preference. So if being in your natural home is not uh, safe, uh, we look to relatives and kin, um, and all this happens within a cultural uh, in a cultural community. Um, so we could transfer a case back to our tribe if, if needs be. Um, so that's really key, and we know that all of us know that when a child is in the center of these concentric circles, uh, maybe kin centric circles, uh, they're resilient. Um, ICWA was so vanguard when it was passed. Uh, the modern child welfare system is not that old. Uh, a CAPTA, the Child Abuse Prevention Treatment Act, was passed. That amended Title IV-E that allowed states to access federal dollars to uh, operate and remove children from their homes and put them in foster care. That was in 1974. So four years later, ICWA was passed. Um, there was no reasonable efforts requirement in from the federal from federal legislation. So active efforts was a, such a vanguard thing. Uh, reasonable efforts came two years after that um, in different legislation, and so really powerful there. Now we have in 48 out of 50 states, there's a kinship finding requirement within all cases. And so if a child gets removed, they look to kin first. Um, that wasn't in, in law in anywhere, uh, but now 48 out of 50 states have adopted that. And then a little over half of the states have fictive kin provisions within their state uh, codes. Um, so the child's tribe, if you will, the child, it could be a teacher, it could be a coach, um, so we, we can look to fictive kin um, to make sure that a child is, is within these concentric circles. And so I, I think the system knows that the, 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 the child welfare uh, mechanism does, is aware of some of the best practices here and why ICWA is the gold standard. Um, it's astounding that it's being challenged right now. Um, I think it's being challenged not necessarily by child welfare advocates or adoption, well, some adoption advocates, but uh, but it's really being charged by people with other motives. Um, there's a great podcast called This Land. If you're a podcast user and want to know more about the Bracken v. Holland case and how it got to where it's at, I encourage you to listen to that podcast. Um, but moving on, so where are we at in, 20, in 2022? But this, this data is two years old, so AFGAR's the data reporting system that keeps a track of children that are in care. There's a little over 400,000 children in care today. Um, and when we look at disproportionality, so comparing the under 18 population of American Indians to the under 18 population of, of American Indian children in foster care, we have a nearly times three disproportionality. All the red states here show that the, the states that have disproportionality. Um, Pennsylvania is not on there. But what I learned actually, I've done work in Pennsylvania uh, a while ago. They, there's some judges that don't even ask the question. And so that's one of the key things about ICWA is asking the question, 
Um, so judges need to ask those questions. Attorneys need to ask the questions. Social workers need to ask the question, um, whether you're an American Indian or have Indian ancestry. Um, and so that's one of the ways that we find out in a case is an ICWA case to begin with. Uh, but you can see that there's a serious issue out there that needs to be addressed. The ways that we've approached it and the work that I get to do um, is where with ICWA courts. Here's a map here of where ICWA courts are at. There's 17, actually just recently, Minnesota, I know these dots are kind of hard to see on that map, but uh, Minnesota just adopted three more ICWA courts. So we are at 20 ICWA courts, which is astounding to me uh, when I think back to when I was hanging out with Bert Hirsch <laughs> in Manhattan there. Um, and we only had two at the time, you know? So we, this has been something that's really exploded. It's a sticky idea. It's a very sticky idea. Um, there is evidence to suggest that adopting this, the data that we have on it, and I could share the data reports, um, is that we get higher tribal participation. Uh, the earlier and sooner a tribal a tribe is involved in a case, the less time a child st stays in foster care. One data report says four months less, actually. And so if a tribe is at the initial hearing, a child stays four months less in foster care, which is significant. Um, higher placement preferences, lower termination of parental rights. Um, and so all the, all good things that we're, we're seeing from um, what we're seeing, the secret sauce, and I'll, I'll, I'll wait for the next slide. I'll put you on edge just for a second. <laughs> but, but we're seeing some secret sauce. We're seeing some magic that, uh, and what we're seeing as far as best practices go. But there's about 3,000 children within all 20 ICWA courts. Um, would, this is all self-reported. Um, and so all the courts tell us kind of how many kids they have and, and this is what the, the culmination of that is. Uh, we got high levels of tribal collaboration. We have a practice of cultural humility from attorneys and social workers and judges. Um, Anti-racist, we are asking people to look in the mirror. Sometimes that's tough, right? So to look in the mirror and be aware and conscious of our implicit bias. Um, and ultimately, we're trying to address that disproportionality. Um, we believe that compliance with ICWA, uh, both the letter of the law, the black letter of the law, but more so the spirit of that law where we can meet people with humanity, where we can meet people with compassion, meet people with, with passion, actually. And I think those two things are really powerful and moving when those two things come together, um, we know it makes a difference. Um, here's the five principles. And so when we say what five principles of ICWA courts, here they are. Um, I'm actually wearing my all Children Matters t-shirt while I do this presentation, orange. Uh, this is recognition of, of the boarding school uh, uh, project that impacted every American Indian that I've ever met. Um, and so I'm, I'm wearing that in commemoration of, of my, my ancestors and many others that were impacted by that and families that were impacted by that. Um, but this is smart that I did. Um, my grand, great grandfather actually um, holding um, his grandchild. And so, but we're seeing, so training, both spirit and letter of the law, judicial leadership, really key, data collection, we want you to be data informed, um, gold standard practice, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in the next slide. But what we're seeing is the secret sauce is in tribal engagement. So the better you engage tribes, led by data. So what, what tribes are appearing most in your jurisdiction? And let's be intentional about building those relationships and those uh, to make sure that we're knocking down barriers for their participation in the proceedings. Um, and so we're working really hard at doing that. Um, in some instances, we've gone on, I've taken trips, <laughs> I've taken judges to uh, four reservations uh, in four days at one time. We traveled over 1,500 miles. Um, we heard story, and I think that's the biggest narrative change is art, actually. And so the, the storytelling the art that we saw, the community, the ceremony that we participated in, I think really had an impact on those 12 attorneys and two judges that went on that trip. Uh, but we've done a lot of other things that really try to create space where relationships could be built. Um, of course, federal and state governments, when they come into the room, it's not like tribes are like, oh yeah, great, you're here. We've been waiting so long and we really trust you already from the beginning, you know? So we, I, I speak that as a tribal member, you know? And so how do we create space where uh, relationships can be, be built, um, humility can be shown. Um, and so that's one of the key things that we're really trying to do and, and develop. Um, as far as the movement goes, like I was talking a little bit about, um, we see this is 
five years ago, we had an Equiport collaborative. At this point, we had five Equiports. We brought them all into a room in a hotel in Denver, and we said, hey, talk to each other. <laughs> That's where we get the five principles from. So talk to each other, share some of the cool things you guys are doing. We heard a lot of cool things, including some judges don't even sit on benches. You know, they come off the bench for Equiport. Uh, their table has medicines that were gifted to them from the tribes, and they have a collaborative legal approach. Um, collaborative legal advocacy is what they call it. Um, but that quickly went. We get, a lot of newspapers have written about us. This is the Billings Gazette talking about Yellowstone County, higher placement preferences almost immediately when they started working better with tribes. Um, we won awards. This is Denver and Adams County in Colorado winning court uh, innovation awards uh, for what they're doing. We're in the Washington Post. Um, we've been on panels, uh, plenary session, almost every child welfare conference or judicial conference there is. We've, we've been on uh, Denver Post featured some of the cool work here in Colorado. Uh, there's a great article, and I will put it in the chat. Um, I'll put it in the questions, I guess. But this is, or you could Google it yourself. This is a great article about that question that I wanted you to think about. Uh, what does it mean to be uh, a gold standard lawyer, a gold standard social worker? Um, and, and these are things that we're seeing uh, in the reports. Um, and so this is a great article that talks a little bit about some of that work. Um, and then just most recently, I was up in Minnesota and the Minnesota Supreme Court, Justice McCaig, one of the two indigenous justices um, on state Supreme Courts throughout the country, um, hosted a NICMA court gathering. Here's all the NICMA court judges in Minnesota. So just really cool stuff, good energy around it. Um, we are seeing some impact. Um, and mostly it's because we are centering families, we're centering voice. Um, and I think we see more self-determination in that process. We see more compassion in that process. Um, and so a lot of judges here, a few of these judges are talking about how do we go upstream from this? Um, that's something some of you guys that might be going into policy might be thinking about. Um, we see some of those implications around access to health, access to education. Um, how can we make those remove those barriers for some of these communities? I'll add one quick thing that I wanna wrap up is that we see that the child welfare system has been abolished in some communities. There's rich communities that nobody calls CPS, nobody calls child protection services on children. And, um, and so we, we've seen the abolishment of child welfare in, in plenty of communities. And so how do we provide resources and how do we provide humanity um, rather than a, a phone call turning people into CPS? How do we meet people with compassion before abuse happens? Uh, how do we care about children and go upstream uh, in, in those ways as a society, um, ultimately? The last thing, and I'll quickly tell you this story. One time when I was representing children, um, it, was a summer, it was a summer day. I was having a hard time. I was burning out. Uh, that's another thing I'll give you. Make sure you do self-care. I was completely burning out. I was working for the Ute Indian tribe out of Utah. Um, and my boss, well, he was an elder at the time. Uh, he's a grandpa, an elder. He was in the, in the courtroom and he came up to me and he said, hey, can I take you to lunch? He takes me to lunch and he tells me the story. It was medicine for me. It changed the way that I approached this work completely. Um, but he told me this story about sea etch. And for the you people, sea etch is a monster that steals children. They hide out in the weeds and the bushes and they'll jump out if a child is by themselves and they'll steal a child. Um, unfortunately today they call social workers sea etch. And so one day Siatch was down by the weeds. He was hiding out and the child was there by themselves. Siatch jumped out, takes the child and puts him in his basket and heads all the way up to the mountains. You can see the mountains in the background there. It's a two day journey to get up to the mountains. So they set up camp and in the middle of the night, the little child cried all night long. Tears flowed from his eyes and horny toad, that's a picture of a horny toad there, wiggled his head inside the basket. And he says, hey, nephew, why are you crying? And the boy through his tears said, well, I've been taken. I'll never hear my language spoken again. I'll never eat my grandmother's cooking. I'll never play with my cousins. I'll never dance in the bear dance. And the horny toad cried with them. He says, you know what, I have an idea. I want you to use me in the morning. And so sure enough, Siach comes and checks on the little boy in the morning, lifts up his wicker basket lid. And the little boy rises up with the horned toad in his hand that feels like an arrowhead and throws the arrowhead into the heart of the beast and he's able to escape and get back home. I know that this work is hard and I know we're facing some real fights right now in the Supreme Court, but humanity always wins. Uh, we've existed and will continue to exist. 
a lot of things that are just words on paper do not transcend to our community the way that we show love and our ceremonies for one another. And I know I'm at my very best. I'm at my very gold standard when I'm a tool in the hand of a child to effectuate positive change. And that positive change is making sure that that child's connected to family, community, and culture. Um, and that's for all children. Um, so that's really my presentation. I want you to be an agent of change out there to, to carry that forward as well. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sheldon. And as always, whenever I hear you speak, I, I really wanna actually just stop and, and reflect for some time on everything that you've shared with us um, and your wisdom as a tribal member and sharing your experience as a lawyer and all that you've done as a teacher as well. Um, I want to encourage everyone to put questions. I know I have a million questions already. I know I will have more after we hear Nikki speak, but please um, put your questions in the Q&A. Um, everything from the importance of tribal representation that Kimberly described and the innovative practices there, also to what we've heard now about the context and the history, the horrendous history that led to ICWA and how everyone on this this panel is really helping to understand um, in the very, I think, humorous and blunt way it was put, how we make this more than words on paper. And I think that's a great segue to our next panelist, Nikki, who um, is doing this work from the government perspective. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Nikki. Thank you, Kara. And um, thank you to the Field Center and the University of Pennsylvania for having me and to my esteemed colleagues. It's, it's wonderful to hear from Kimberly and Sheldon. Um, I'm always learning so much from you both. So thank you. Um, and Niyoshi, thank you for, for running the slides for me today. I appreciate it. So we'll go to the next slide, please. I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about Minnesota. Um, so Minnesota is on traditional Dakota lands. Um, the name Minnesota means land where the waters reflect the sky. Um, we have 11 tribal nations across the state, um, seven Anishinaabe or Ojibwe and four Dakota communities in, in the southern part of the state. Um, we represent approximately one and a half percent of the total population of the state. Um, and I wanted to, to really talk about um, not just Indian child welfare, but a broader context to start about our tribal state relations. Um, so we have a really high level of engagement with our tribal nations in Minnesota between state government and the tribes. Um, recently passed in 2021 by our state legislature is our government to government consultation statute. Uh, Starting in 2002, Governor Ventura at the time passed an executive order um, mandating government to government consultation with our tribal nations and state agencies. That has been continued by every governor since, including Governor Walls, and um, was codified for the first time last session. Um, so we're in the process at the Office of Indian Policy um, to engage with our tribal nations and talk to them about what they want that consultation process to look like with the Department of Human Services. So I have had the pleasure of driving all over Minnesota um, late summer and this fall, just yesterday, I was at, at two of our tribal communities um, to talk about these, these consultations, um, what those policies and procedures should look like um, but also to talk about real substantive issues. And child welfare is always at the top of the list, um, not just for tribal staff, but for tribal leaders who always have ICWA at the top of their priorities in their community. Um, and everything that, that I am gonna touch on today, I just wanted to give that background because it would, be, it would be much more difficult if we didn't have these ongoing efforts to engage meaningfully with our tribal communities. Um, the last thing on this, we are a state supervised county administered human services system. So I mentioned we have 11 tribes. We also have 87 counties. Um, so we work with, with all of those entities um, to, to provide our human services, including child welfare. Next slide, please. So looking at our data in Minnesota, 
<clears throat> you heard a little bit about um, disproportionality nationally from Sheldon. And um, Minnesota is unique um, in a lot of ways, not always in a good way. Um, <clears throat> we call this the Minnesota paradox. It's a term that was coined by Professor Samuel Myers. He's an economist here at the University of Minnesota that Minnesota is known for being a leader in a lot of different areas. We're well-educated, um, we're healthy, we're active, and yet we have some of the starkest racial disparities across the board um, for, for many communities. And we certainly have um, glaring disparities for our Native families and children in, in child welfare. So before the enactment of ICWA, Data showed that Minnesota removed about one in every seven Indian children from their homes. Um, current data shows that Minnesota continuously reports the highest in the nation out of home placement for native children. Um, states who have a higher um, American Indian population um, show minimum percentages of disproportionality and removal of American Indian children from their homes. So compared to white children, um, native children experience a higher rate of involvement in the child welfare system. Um, looking at our 2019 child welfare data, we have the highest rates of contact with Minnesota's child protection system. Um, native children are about five times more likely to be reported as abused or neglected than their white counterparts. And they're about 17 times more likely to experience an out-of-home placement than, than a white child in Minnesota. Um, this graph here shows information all the way back to 2015 and up to 2020, showing the percentage of children who entered care the year listed. Uh, and again, keep in mind that our total native population in Minnesota is about one and a half percent. So this is, this is significant. Next slide, please. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the efforts that are underway to make progress on these disparities and this disproportionality in, in out-of-home placement especially. Um, we do everything committed to building on the strengths of the communities in Minnesota and providing supports for our families. So DHS has engaged with our Indian Child Welfare Act Advisory Council that I'll talk about later um, our tribal child welfare departments across the state and urban Indian organizations to develop the Early Intervention with American Indian Families Grant. Uh, this grant provides direct supports to families through financial help with rent, utilities, transportation, medical, behavioral, chemical health care, any basic needs, um, and including cultural activities to reduce the risk of child protection involvement. And this really aligns with uh, both the Indian Child Welfare Act and our state, um, state statute called the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act. That's, um, uh, that's a state version of ICWA that was passed in our state in 1985 um, and has been amended over the years. Um, this, it, all of those pieces that I talked about really translate to what we think of as active efforts, a um, significant component of ICWA. It's what can we do to stabilize families and ensure that, um, that they are supported in the way that they need so that they don't have to enter um, the child protection system in Minnesota. So during that first year, six grants were awarded to tribal nations and to urban tribal organizations throughout the state. Um, 290 uh, Native families, including a total of 684 children, had received funding. And as a result, um, 282 families avoided an out-of-home placement through this program. Um, one grantee of ours stated that uh, this year marked the lowest number of court-involved families they had because they were able to provide that early intervention prior to involvement in the child protection system. The Minnesota legislature has also authorized additional county funding starting in 2017 to offset a portion of costs for Indian children who are placed in, in foster care. Um, so in Minnesota, the way it works is um, the Title IV E funds that are provided for out-of-home placement, about half of that cost um, is reimbursed by the federal government. The other half um, 
is split between the counties and the state. Um, and the counties have a, have a significant share. Um, the state of Minnesota um, ranks pretty low usually on, on the amount of funding that we provide for child welfare. So um, a large portion of that is, is held by the counties themselves. Um, so this funding was passed to help alleviate some of that uh, burden on, on the counties. Um, and that aid is tied to a compliance system with the Indian Child Welfare Act and the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act. Um, the review process that's connected with that was designed and established in collaboration with our tribal and Indian urban um, entities, our counties, our children's justice initiative representatives, and our DHS staff. Um, the statewide average shows an increase of compliance from 49% back in 2017 when we implemented the system to 85% for 2022. And I'll talk a little bit more about that system um, at the end. The Department of Human Services is also working in partnership with the University of Minnesota Duluth um, through our tribal training and certification partnership. So this offers certification training for both county social workers and tribal social workers um, in, who are working in child protection and child welfare to further promote improved compliance with legal requirements and to look at improved outcomes um, for children and families that are involved in the system. In 2020, 50% of children entering care were placed with a relative um, from our, as we show in our out of home care report. Um, Minnesota statutes, we are one of those states that dictate um, that we must first consider placing them with suitable individuals who are related to them, then consider individuals with whom they have what we call a significant contact. So that's that important person in their life. It can be, um, it can be that fictive kin, um, tribal member, uh, other, other important person, neighbor, mom's best friend, something like that. Um, in 2015, the number was at, was at 36%. And in 2020, we've jumped up to 62% that have been placed with, with the relative. Next slide, please. So in Minnesota, we have um, what we call the Indian Child Welfare Initiative Tribes. So this is a significant child welfare reform effort here in Minnesota. Um, this program was created with a collaborative commitment between our, tribe, our tribes, our counties, and the state governments um, with the shared goal of improving child welfare outcomes for Native children. Uh, with state legislative authority, DHS transfers the roles and responsibilities uh, from the county to the tribes so that state funds uh, can be allocated to support um, the tribal operation of, of that program and ensure that tribes have access to the federal 4E reimbursements for eligible costs. Um, so this started in 2008, starting with our uh, Leech Lake, uh, Band of Ojibwe and our White Earth um, tribe as well. And um, then in Red Lake, we added them in 2021. Um, so we currently have three initiative tribes. The Mille Lacs Band is um, in the planning stages right now and we're hoping to, to bring them fully into the program in um, just the next year or two. And it, it's, it's Worth noting, it takes, um, it takes several years usually to bring a tribe um, into the, the initiative system. Um, from passing legislation, these have to be, uh, the legislature has to be on board and, and pass legislation to authorize this, um, as well as a lot of planning takes place and, and intensive work between the department um, at the state level and the tribe, as well as with, with the counties. So you're eligible for this um, if you are a federally recognized tribe within Minnesota. Um, you have to have a tribal court with jurisdiction over child custody proceedings. Um, you need to enter into a 4E agreement with the state of Minnesota. You have to have the capacity to respond to reports of child abuse and neglect um, in accordance with our Minnesota statute, which is um, chapter 260C. 
And you have to have expertise and a, a long history of providing culturally specific child welfare services to, to your families, which we know our tribes do have. Um, now overarching each of these programs is, is individual to the tribe's cultural needs for their families. So no program looks the same, which of course is the goal um, to ensure that, that communities are assessing what, what their families need um, and that as a state and the counties that we're providing the supports to, um, to help make that happen. Next slide, please. So here's some um, just examples from our initiative tribes in Minnesota. So Red Lake Nation, as I said, is our newest initiative tribe. They transformed their approach and service delivery system to be rooted in Anishinaabe language, culture, traditions, beliefs, and values. Um, their program, and I'm gonna try and pronounce it. I always, I always mess it up, but we'll see how it goes. Um, is means uplifting our relatives. And it focuses on an intergenerational approach um, focused on family wellness. So that includes not just physical, but emotional, spiritual, mental, and cultural awareness for each family member, um, inclusive in each, um, each aspect, each stage of life. So looking at infancy, adolescence, adulthood, and also our elders. Um, the framework that they use is person-centered trauma and resiliency focused, and it's grounded in the Anishinaabe worldview, the seven grandfather teachings, and also looks to the National Association of Social Work, uh, code of ethics and cultural humility. At White Earth Nation, um, they've instituted the MOMS program. It stands for Maternal Outreach and Mitigation Services. This is an innovative response to the opioid epidemic impacting um, our pregnant native mothers and their babies. And it includes a culturally specific holistic treatment program. Um, it's for parenting mothers and their partners and provides daily outpatient substance use disorder treatment, mental health services, prenatal care at the same time with registered nurses, culturally based services, um, that traditional spiritual healing and uh, medication assisted therapy, along with childcare for those that, that have um, other children as well as, as their infants. Um, work by this dedicated multidisciplinary team has led to a significant reduction in the number of babies that are born with neonatal opioid withdrawal symptoms. And last we have uh, the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. Their child abuse prevention program supports traditional and cultural activities that are geared towards the prevention of child abuse and neglect, focusing on healthy Anishinaabe child rearing. Leech Lake is looking to enhance their family preservation unit by hiring six additional case managers and to bring funds directly to families prior to entering child protection. Again, that uh, focusing on that prevention piece. Um, they're looking to um, increase the size of their unit and allow for their staff to intervene and engage with families at an earlier point. Um, Leech Lake is one of the, the communities that I was visiting yesterday and we were talking a little bit about their program. And one thing that we hear over and over um, that really is at the heart of all this is it matters who, who their workers are. It matters who's providing this service. Um, the historical trauma that so many tribal families carry with them includes a deep distrust of government, especially in child welfare systems. Um, working with staff who are familiar to them, who look like them, who are community members in a lot of cases, um, might even be related to you, uh, that goes a long way. Um, something especially meaningful that Red Lake does uh, is to change just their vocabulary. Um, their, um, their program is called Uplifting Our Relatives and that's, that's how they refer to the people that they work with. They don't talk about clients. Um, they don't even say families, they say, um, they say relatives and, and that's exactly how they treat them. 
Next slide, please. So looking at um, our ICWA Advisory Council, which is a, a really important entity that, that we work with at the Department of Human Services. Um, this group was authorized in as part of the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act, which we call MIFPA. Um, this body of individuals is made of one representative from each of the Minnesota tribal nations. So 11 representatives um, and then six appointed Indian urban representatives. We have three from Minneapolis, two from St. Paul, and one from Duluth. Um, they make recommendations and suggestions on policies, procedures, and guidance that impact Native children and their families. They meet quarterly for two days with DHS staff to discuss a broad array of child welfare and child protection issues, as well as legislative topics, um, and most recently have worked together for input on the Federal Family First Prevention Services Act plan for Minnesota. Um, and it's not our, our only body of individuals for government to government consultation that I noted at the beginning um, regarding issues impacting native children and families. But this is one really important component to, to our tribal engagement with the state. Next slide, please. So something else that you'll see in ICWA um, is um, talks about the possibility of uh, establishing agreements between um, tribes and states. And we have one in Minnesota. Um, we call it the Tribal State Agreement. Um, it was first passed in 1999 or per first signed by the DHS commissioner and all 11 um, tribal chairpersons at the time. And it was amended in 2007. Um, and it's essentially a best practices guide for, for Indian child welfare, as well as incorporating pieces of um, the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act. Um, it addresses uh, issues such as jurisdiction or powers of tribes and states over the care of, their, of Indian children. Um, but it, it represents a development of a comprehensive working relationship among each of the 11 tribes and the Minnesota Department of Human Services for delivery of our child welfare services. Um, it outlines uh, a number of policies and procedures that are agreed to both by the tribes and the departments and specifies those roles and duties for each. Um, we also have um, a meeting every year. We hold our, our annual tribal state agreement meeting. Um, we're not too creative here in, in Minnesota with this one, but. Um, as part of this agreement, the, the parties also meet annually by June 30th of every year to address systemic issues related to compliance with ICWA and MIFPA and to address possible legislative um, proposals and, and resolutions. So every year, the Department of Human Services, including um, our commissioner and several staff, as well as um, tribal leaders and tribal child welfare staff um, come together. Our attendance varies anywhere from about 20 to 50 participants um, and come together and, and just talk through issues related to Indian child welfare. Um, over the years that that's resulted in some, some really impactful um, pieces, some of the things that, that you've already heard about here today. Um, worth noting, I mentioned we have a state supervised county administered system we also have several county tribal agreements and memorandum of understanding that set expectations for how Indian child welfare is handled more locally. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna um, spend just the last couple of slides talking about our compliance processes in, in Minnesota. So we have two processes in place where Minnesota looks at compliance with ICWA and MIFPA. Um, so we have compliance complaints and compliance reviews. So the first one is um, if we get a complaint which comes to the department, um, can come from um, anyone, this comes out of our tribal state agreement. So this dates all the way back to 1999. Um, it's a, there's a formal review process uh, where that comes into our, our ICWA unit, um, where a violation of, of ICWA or MIFA has been made, um, allegations of such. 
And um, we provide a summary and put together a report that's then provided to the county agency or tribal agency and a complainant um, who reported. Uh, we receive about uh, 20 to 30 of these a year. It also goes to our ombudsperson for American Indian families. Um, and then we work through a corrective action plan with, uh, with the appropriate entity. The second, um, the second system is the compliance review system. So this stems back to that 2017 legislation I mentioned that is um, tied to the funding to counties. This is a much more prescribed um, process. Uh, we have a random selection of cases that are pulled with sp specific parameters where an Indian child's identified an out-of-home placement the previous year to, um, to review. Um, again, that funding is, is to offset the cost of foster care for Indian children. Um, and a proportionate share of non-federal dollars are allocated to counties who remain in compliance with ICWA and MIFPA. Um, with the allocate, allocated dollars through the aid, the department developed and implemented this case review system to monitor and evaluate county agency performance with uh, implementation and practices of those laws. Um, there was a work group that came together to establish those processes, including some of our CJI representatives and Minnesota tribes, um, looking at what provisions need to be reviewed, um, how to track the compliance scoring for each provision, and um, the, the statute uh, talks about substantial compliance. So there was a lot of discussion around what that meant, what number, um, what percentage we needed to get to. Um, so we started with that substantial compliance started at um, 80% that you had to be, um, have 80% of, of the requirements um, met to be, um, to be considered substantially compliant with ICWA and MIFPA. We moved that up to 90% in 2019 and then in 2020 and um, going on, you have to be 100% compliant um, to, to get your funding. If you're not um, compliant for two consecutive years, uh, you see a withhold of 50% of your aid. Next slide, please. So this graph just shows the amount of improvement for each year on cases reviewed. Uh, we know that compliance is just one component to understanding and learning ICWA and MIFPA. And we also know that um, at DHS at the state, we don't have enough capacity to review every ICWA case in the state. So our sample is just that. It doesn't represent all ICWA compliance in all the counties. And that's something that, that we continue to hear um, from our tribal leaders. Um, part of the process is a program improvement plan that's developed in collaboration with staff when an agency is found to be out of compliance. Um, we also uh, host uh, ICWA coffee talks, um, six sessions each year that are, uh, have about 100 to 200 participants covering all kinds of topics from data entry into our system um, to implementation of policies. Uh, I will note, uh, Kimberly, you said something about um, what kinds of cases, what pieces of ICWA you see come up mo most often. Um, those notice and inquiry pieces are, are uh, front and center for us in Minnesota. Um, the good news about that is those are pretty easy to fix, um, but we see uh, good progress being made on active efforts and, and other components of ICWA. And I just want to wrap up by saying these, you know, these numbers have been really encouraging as we've seen our baseline increase um, over time and, and pretty quickly. Um, but for me, the biggest win has not just been the numbers, but really the culture change that we've seen from our county partners. They're engaged in ICWA in a way that I've never seen before. They're learning, they're curious, they're open, um, and they're being trained well. Um, that's also having an impact on tribal enrollments. That's another issue that we've seen come out um, of our tribes is that they're asking for support for their enrollments departments because now that um, counties are asking the questions more often, the tribes are getting, are getting more requests. Um, so we're looking to see how we can best support them there. 
So we can just go to my last slide, please. And this is just some contact information for me or for our Indian Child Welfare Unit at uh, the Department of Human Services, who is really charged with implementing and doing a, an amazing job with all this work. Thank you, Carol, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you so much, Nikki. And thank you for sharing the tremendous work that you and your colleagues are doing in Minnesota, providing direct supports, keeping families out of the child welfare system, partners, partnerships with tribes, and really thinking deeply about your compliance and your practices. I want to invite all of the panelists to join me on screen now um, so that we can go into the Q&A. We've got a robust Q&A, and I really appreciate that. And I invite the panelists, um, if there are particular questions that you would like to answer directly, please feel free to do that in the Q&A. But I wanted to start us off with a question that I think is on everyone's mind and was raised in, um, in many of the questions that we received from attendees today. We all know what's looming and what happens if we get a decision, which I think I can fairly say everyone who has worked so deeply and this means so much to um, in their own personal life, in their professional life, if we get a decision that does not go the way we think it should, what will happen and um, what choices might, might you all be faced with in your work and how would we move forward? So Kara, this is Kimberly and I'm gonna go ahead and, and start with um, a little bit more background on the Brackeen case. Um, I, I do wanna just say, um, I, I so enjoy hearing from my co-panelists about things and there are so many things coming up for me about work that's been done in California that's so aligned with the work that is happening in Minnesota, um, legislation that we've done and, and so on. So there's just such a rich conversation there, but needing to pivot towards the Brackeen v. Holland case. So I'm just going to um, very briefly give some background. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this is a facial constitutional attack on the Indian Child Welfare Act based on a commandeering argument and a legal protection argument. I wanna start with the commandeering argument. Um, very basically, the attack is that um, ICWA is a reach down into functionality at the state level mm -hmm. that is unconstitutional because we have a constitutional prohibition on the federal government commandeering or taking over state functions. Um, now on the tribal side, we believe that that is, um, is not accurate and obviously have briefed to, to that. And then on the equal protection side, the allegation or the, um, the accusation, gosh, I, I use such loaded words, um, the, the, uh, the thinking that has been put forward to the court is that um, the Indian Child Welfare Act is a race-based statute and um, the tribal perspective is quite the opposite that Indian children are citizens of sovereign nations and that citizenship is the basis for the Indian Child Welfare Act, not race. And so that is what is also before the Supreme Court. Now to um, carry to your question and to the question that I, you know, is alluded to in some of the questions, uh, you know, what happens and also the why. Um, and Sheldon uh, referred to this a little bit as well. So, um, the outcomes potentially from the Supreme Court, uh, one could be, you know, striking down equal just on commandeering, one could be just on equal protection, and the other could be on both grounds. In the event that, and this is to answer one question, um, in the event that the court were to find that the Indian Child Welfare Act is unconstitutional based on commandeering, uh, my thinking, and I'll just say um, my thinking, is that um, the the states with state ICWA statutes. So um, Nikki mentioned the MIPFA. In California, we have what we call Cal ICWA or KICWA. And if I remember correctly, there's about seven, eight states that have relatively wholesale importation of the Indian Child Welfare Act into state statute, and then a handful of others that have portions. So um, a question would be, will those state statutes survive? And I think the answer is yes. You don't have a commandeering problem if the court is only ruling on that. And then as to those other states, there's probably legislative fixes for those states that want to, um, you know, kind of continue to have best practice in their child welfare systems. Now, as to the equal protection question, um, a loss um, on the basis of equal protection is a much more serious blow 
not just to the Indian Child Welfare Act, but to Indian law writ large. And so there's not necessarily, uh, or there is not a legislative fix to such a loss at the court. Um, and so then what is the response in that way? And you know, I think what you've heard from my co-presenters and, and perhaps from me is that because ICWA is best practice, because it is the gold standard, there will be ways in which I believe Indian country will rally and all of the allies to Indian country with regard to ICWA. Um, just wanna point out that I believe it was 27 amicus briefs from many non-native organizations, including Casey family, um, who've been incredible advocates in this space um, over the years. Um, we have the two prior cases at the Supreme Court, most importantly, the baby girl case, which was a, a, a very different type of attack on the Indian Child Welfare Act. That's the case that prompted the development of that language that it was the gold standard. And that came from, from Casey's um, Casey family um, amicus brief. So there is this incredible tidal wave of um, support for what has been achieved in tribal child welfare and quite honestly, the moving of the needle generally in child welfare through the Indian Child Welfare Act. So it's my belief that Indian country and all of its allies will um, figure out ways to capture all of that work. And I wanna give just one brief example for kind of the, you know, a little bit in the rabbit hole um, for practitioners is thinking about ways in which we can continue to have tribes have a place in courtrooms. That I think is very key. Uh, Nikki mentioned the, the importance of, of notice to uh, that a child is a native child and that a tribe has a citizenship involved in a case. So what does it look like without the Indian Child Welfare Act to see tribes continue to receive notice and have standing in courtrooms? There are ways that we can do that. The way we think about fictive kin, for example, the way we think about de facto parents. Some states have de facto parent statutes, some have judge made law. What does it look like to have tribes be seen in that parental role, bringing assets and bringing resources to tribal families in the system? So I think that that's one of the things that we will see happen, even with a, a loss or bruises to the Indian Child Welfare Act. We're not all going away. Tribes are not going away. And so I believe that advocates will figure out ways, strategic ways to use all of the tools in the toolbox, legislation, litigation, policy making, to make sure that the last years since 1978 really have just been a path towards a rethinking of child welfare and that we don't have an end of any of this story. So I hope that's somewhat responsive to the question. Um, I, I sometimes get on my soapbox. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering whether, and I wanna um, just make sure if you did not see the second CLE code that I did not announce at the beginning of Q&A, uh, the second CLE code is tribe and the final CLE code will be announced um, before we wrap up today. But, um, and thank you to, to Sheldon and Nikki and Kimberly for answering some of the questions in the Q&A. Nikki and Sheldon, would you wanna talk maybe briefly about this discussion, as Kimberly mentioned, of all the work that has gone into making this the gold standard. What does that mean? What can we learn from it? And how should we all be thinking of it, even again, separate and apart, as Kimberly noted, um, from the upcoming Supreme Court arguments? Yeah, I can um, add to that. I think um, yes to everything that Kimberly said. Um, and just want to point out that Minnesota is working. We have our, our state MIFPA, um, but there's a work group that's working right now. I think they started meeting 20 minutes ago today um, to wrap up a draft of amendments to our state um, ICWA statute to, uh, to strengthen it um, so that it can withstand um, the commandeering um, claim at least. Um, so looking at that, we also have had other groups just thinking about the gold standard of ICWA, um, we have disparities with other, um, with other communities in Minnesota, including our African-American children and families and child welfare. Um, years ago, they've, they looked at um, our MIFPA and ICWA and decided that they wanted to write a similar statute, um, the African-American Family Preservation Act. Um, that's still um, in bill form that hasn't been passed as of yet but it really opened this conversation about what is so wonderful about ICWA, what is so meaningful about MIFPA, 
and how does that best serve our families, um, all of our families in Minnesota, and, um, and what can we learn from that? Um, I think that you're dead on, Kimberly, about looking at how, how the whole system is, is kind of shifting and recognizing this. I think, um, I think a lot about um, active efforts and um, how those are, really, those are really prevention efforts. Um, there's this big push around prevention efforts and not investing so much in deep end child welfare, but how can we support families and provide their basic needs and meet them where they are um, to support them? And that, that is active efforts. That's really one of the hearts of, of ICWA um, and how, and tribes being a resource in, in helping families to do that. Um, placement preferences, another, an, significant piece of, of ICWA and MIFPA about where a child is going to be placed when they are placed out of the home um, and having tribal input in that. Well, families at the top of most placement preferences, unless tribes have, have chosen otherwise, um, and that is, uh, that is federal policy now. That is a lot of state policy is to, is to place with, with relatives or fictive kin. Um, so we're seeing kind of shadows of ICWA practice show up in, in general child welfare practice that that's really encouraging. I'll quickly add, so some of the strategies that we're, that I'm working on is some of that already been said, and none of this is like genius or just like we made this really great, great uh, strategy up. Uh, four parts though. So one, getting more state ICWAs out there. There's 13 state ICWAs that, that currently are, are out there. Um, how do we that map of disproportionality. There's a lot of states that are on there that have had conversations with us in the past about uh, help around doing a state ICWA. So how do we help them in the process of developing a great state ICWA that's comprehensive? Number two, kind of like what uh, Nikki's talking about, how do, if ICWA's gold standard, how do we leverage some of those things and put them into state code for all children? Uh, there's an example of this, Not, nothing that we did, nothing that I did. Uh, House Bill 1227 up in the state of Washington, you'll see they've tightened up the language on the front end of the case. A lot of equal language on the front end of these cases um, as far as burdens of proof. Um, also um, raise the standard from reasonable efforts up to diligent efforts, not active efforts, but up to diligent efforts. And so we can see the influence of ICWA. They actually explicitly say, the reason we're doing this is for black and indigenous children. Um, and so the 1227, take a look at it, it's pretty great. It goes into effect, I think next year is when it goes into effect. Number three, leveraging the social science, uh, social science that we know from ICWA courts, uh, getting tribes involved earlier, uh, building partnerships, cultural humility, gold standard lawyering and social work that you've been thinking about this whole time. Uh, and then the fourth thing is how do we get more federal funding to tribal systems? And so uh, there's 574 tribes out there. There's about 400 tribal courts out there. Um, so how do we get funding? There are some po pockets of funding that have increased uh, a program called the Tawahi Initiative. They're increasing the funding coming up and then tribal court improvement programs, uh, e increasing funding for tribal systems to, like Red Lake, uh, indigenize this process for their community. Not to, We know the state system doesn't work. Um, so to have a tribe model and try to do the state system is, is an atrocity. Uh, don't do that if you're a tribe. <laughs> so uh, come together and let's have a conversation of what that, what that looks like. How do you keep children safe in your community? You know, what does healthy families look like in your community? Um, so how do we develop those principles, those legal principles, frankly? So those are the four things that we're kind of working on. I can't think of a better way to conclude our panel for today. I am so grateful and thankful to um, our distinguished panelists for sharing all of their expertise. Um, I know how much work went into your presentation and we are really all the better for our understanding of the importance of ICWA and really the tremendous work all of you are doing um, on behalf of Indian children and families. I want to really thank um, the staff of Penn Carey Law Conference and Events for pulling this together, the faculty, students and staff at the Field Center, in particular Nema Ali, who actually brought this idea to us in the first place and did a lot of the legwork to bring everyone together today. Your last and final passcode is decision, so please make sure to write that down if you are seeking CLE credit. Um, and I'll just end by invite, inviting all of you to join us again um, uh, for our next session of this um, symposium, which will be 
think, and, and I just lost the date, December 1st at 2 p.m. when we'll be talking in great depth with legal experts, tribal activists, and tribal members about the consequences and implications of the Supreme Court's case. We look forward to seeing you again there. Thank you again to my panelists, that um, our panelists today. It was truly a pleasure to hear from you, and we wish everyone a good day.